Hello and welcome to our special series, Tracking the Recovery, where we are focusing on what has been quite a beaten down sector for the last few years, real estate. Last week, we looked at the bigger picture, at the big supply-demand mismatch in the sector, the high levels of unsold inventories most companies are stuck with, and the debt, which is quite clearly bogging them down. Today, we slice the market and look at the northern and NCR region, where all the problems are only too clearly evident. So what's the picture looking like on the ground? Well, joining me for the granular take on the sector and the market are Pranav Ansel, Vice Chairman of Ansel Properties, Mohit Goyal, CEO of OMAX, and Anurag Mathur of JLLM. Pranav, let me start off with you. One of the biggest players in the NCR region. Uh, how is the situation looking? Because the macro numbers are still looking troublesome, if you look at it uh, sure. overall. Three lakh unsold houses, you know, uh, 36 month, uh, months for the inventory to clear up in the NCR region while prices have gone up. So it's not looking at a pretty picture. Um, not as bad as uh, you're making it sound. I think the markets, uh, the NCR market is good for people who are delivering. I think mm -hmm. let's categorize developers also into two categories. I think there have been lots of new developers in the market who've launched big projects, taken up big challenges, and not even had lands. I just read an article where two developers launched a project where they didn't even have the land. So I think a lot of these figures of these three lakh uh, unsold units, I think these are units which still have to be built or still have to be launched or still have to be sold. So market is not so bad. In fact, last two months we've seen uh, sales go up by about 20-25% in the NCR market, mm. like Gurgaon, Kundli, Greater Noida, Ghaziabad, where we are doing big projects. And uh, one of the reasons I would say is because we are delivering. I think delivery is a big issue. Customers today want to see projects being delivered, handed over and executed, rather than just plans and just brochures. So I think that's a big factor. I think change of government and the budget has given a slight boost. I won't say a great boost, but a slight boost. And we have seen sales picking up much better than what they were about six months ago. Mm. Mohit, are you seeing a, a, a gradual pickup? Are you expecting the festive season to be better than anticipated? What's the sense you're getting? Because you're in 30 markets. So, I mean, uh, you know, you have a fair amount of spread out there. So, yeah, we are majorly uh, working in a for budget was actually majorly for affordable segment of real estate. It has given a really a sentiment booster. And now in terms of numbers, uh, I would say the numbers haven't increased, say, by 25%, 50%, but the sentiments have gone up big time. I mean, last six months, it has gone up big time. So now I see this festive, festive season, our sales picking up by, say, 25 30% easily. And the queries have been uh, starting coming in, flowing in, which will actually convert into sales. Mm -hmm. So this festive season, I think, for the developers, is going to be very nice. Is it that going to be that simple, the conversion, Anurag? Because somewhere, uh, the general ballpark is that there is a four to five quarter lag between an economic pickup and genuine demand to come in in the real estate sector. Uh, what sense are you getting right now? Yeah, true. So it is true. I think uh, we are quite easily about four to six quarters away. From a full, full recovery and, uh, and, and, a, and a fresh start in a certain sense. But uh, you are limiting that discussion to housing units, to housing only. I mean, we have to look at the other sectors as well. You have to look at retail, you have to look at commercial. If you see the, the NCR market, the commercial office supply is at one of its lowest because there, isn't, there hasn't been as much... Uh, supply coming into the market the last two, three years, developers stopped building commercial assets. And the leasing activity was what it was. I mean, it wasn't really uh, going through the roof, but it wasn't bad either. So we had decent leasing going on and no new supply coming in. As a result, today, uh, if we are really at the cusp of a recovery, economic recovery, we are sitting with very little commercial office real estate supply and similar is the situation with retail. We don't have as much retail stock available in the country and in this, in this region. And if once again we have to look at, a, at an economic recovery, new assets would take typically two to three years to, to build So there up. is a mismatch that you see coming in over there. So you're saying that that will possibly bounce back much faster because of the supply constraints. Correct. Pranav, uh, I want to ask you a, a, a basic question from an industry standpoint. Sure. You spoke about the fact that many developers came, they've not got the wherewithal to start, the, to complete their projects. So if you're looking at a four to five quarters to recovery, what happens to the sector? Because you know what has also been true about the real estate sectors, I'm talking about the larger landscape, is that it is a sector that has been on the brink. Sure. Many people have said that 
this is going to collapse, this company is going to collapse, it's, it's over leveraged, it's, it's not going to have the staying power. Do you think many of the smaller companies, the stressed out companies will have the staying power to last four to five quarters before you know the recovery truly happens? You know, one thing about the sector, we must be very, very clear. The sector may be having liquidity problems, but there are no solvency issues because all of us have very good solid land banks. The land banks have a great value. If you compare real estate to an industry, all our lands are in prime locations, which have a developable value. Because of liquidity issues, the development may get delayed. Whereas if you compare yourself to an industry, which is probably in a location which nobody knows, and if that industry stops working, the land has no value, the machinery and equipment has depreciated. So we are sitting on an appreciating inventory. Mm. Of course, like I said, liquidity issues have been there for all the sectors. So I don't think the concern that, you know, hmm. the companies would go under, I don't think that's okay. a point of concern. But, you know, from a banking perspective, how is it looking from the, uh, for, for finances? Because, you know, uh, top 11 companies have 42,000 crores of debt. Uh, banks are not lending. They've got a very high exposure. The RBI has been very, very strict in its norms for lending to real estate. What sense are you getting on the financial side? Look, it is a problem. Liquidity is a problem. And uh, debt is an issue. But I don't think it's... It's, uh, it's as much as it is made out to be. Uh, if you look at the debt levels in real estate industry, compare it to other uh, industries. I mean, we talk about aviation, telecom, infrastructure, etc. It's insignificant compared to that. But it's a much larger balance sheet. But look at the quality of collateral here. It's so much better. It's so much easily liquidable. What happens uh, for good deals and for people who are delivering, and I, I emphasize on that, I think there is still money in the market. We just raised money last month from Brookfield, mm -hmm. which is the largest uh, real estate yeah. fund, which is the largest real estate fund of the world. So I think money is still available. If you have the right product and you've delivered and you've got a track record, and mainly if you have land, which is a bigger set. So I think money is available. And also the point we need to highlight, and I speak about it all the time, is giving us an infrastructure status. I think real estate is the only sector where 250 industries are linked with us mm -hmm. and we have no status whatsoever. Because of that, we have high cost of debt. Because of that, we have a bad perception and RBI looks at us badly. So I think there are okay. several factors. So I think that needs okay. to be Mohit, you're raising, uh, diluting equity to raise money as well. What's the feedback been and what is the time frame that you're looking at? So we are at really a primary stage right now and uh, the feedback has been really positive. There are, uh, we're talking to a lot of uh, companies in UK uh, to raise debt. So they are pretty much optimistic about the Indian story and uh, particularly our story because we're majorly into affordable segment and they, they also they believe that now Indian story is going to go well. So we are thinking of raising for the next one, one and a half years. We head into a short break now but on the other side we look at individual micro markets and see what the trends out there are. Stay with us. Powered by Kohler. Knowledge Partner, JLL. BSC Investors Protection Fund presents Investor Awareness. We should have exposure to international market across globe, across region and currencies is a prudent thing so that you get a balanced portfolio. But this portfolio will be volatile compared to your Indian equity portfolio. It is not from generating higher returns, but it's more from balancing from the risk of Indian equities. BSE Investors Protection Fund presents Investment Ladder on Smart Money. Hands are made to play. Hands are made to share. Kohler presents Pure Clean, multifunction bidet seats. Enjoy hands-free hygiene for your everyday routine. Hands are made for love. Every CEO needs to know his market. It's about growth. It's about strategy. It's being on top of your game. It's really about getting started. Sometimes you need to throw people out of business to stay in business. What a CEO knows, what a CEO needs to know. Let's talk business. Watch in business. It's active. It's an instrument to hedge your risk and it's all about the action. Welcome to the world of derivatives. Analyze all the trends, all the happenings of the last week gone by in the world of derivatives. 
and get a sense as to what the strategy is going forward for next week. World of Derivatives, presented by BSC Investors Protection Fund. Presented by BSC Investors Protection Fund. Welcome back. We are tracking the recovery in the real estate sector and I have a full house over here. Pranav, I'm going to start with you. Uh, you know, uh, the policy issues have always been uh, a big bugbear as far as the real estate sector is concerned. And the most recent has been the issue in Okla where uh, flats have come up, development has happened and the National uh, Tr uh, Green Tribunal has stepped in saying that you can't uh, sure. actually sell that. Uh, what impact is that going to have on the Okla Noida region? You know, I think it has a major impact. Uh, I think all the developers who have been, you know, constructing there, the, currently I think the uh, order is that they can make, uh, start, keep construction on, but they can't get a completion certificate, mm. which means the people who they've sold it to cannot occupy. So I think from a developer's point of view, every approval we require should be told to us prior we start construction. What happens in our sector is that once you're almost there, you know, and you've got thousands of customers, you've made the building, you've spent all the money, you've taken the expensive debt, then some new tribunal comes up or some new regulator comes up and puts, you know, basically a gun on the developer's head and said, you get it. So I think it's going to be a major impact. Anurag, really my question to you is there are two aspects to this. One, what collateral damage does this do in the entire region? Because I'm sure it has an impact across sure, the region. Yeah. And the second is that what is your own estimate? Uh, you know, the Okla issue is a more recent one. Mm -hmm. But there are multiple such projects which have been, or areas which have been kind of stalled. And the stalled projects, like the power sector, etc., is quite large as a quantum over here. Can you give us a sense of how big it is? Well, I, it's difficult for me to size that, to say what's the impact, etc. But look at Noida itself. It's happened twice in very rapid succession. Before this, just what, two years ago was the, the Noida mm -hmm. extension. Yeah. piece that happened and that seriously brought the whole credibility of the the the, the developer community the government etc into a focus and it's happened once again uh, Mohit, let's uh, look at the growth coming back to the ground up growth that you're seeing you're in multiple markets um, you've got very many uh, projects in in the cards uh, 30 cities nine states uh, where is the growth coming in? What segment are you seeing the first green shoots or the real pickup? If you can give us a broad spread. I think three states uh, out of nine, which is Haryana, Punjab and UP. Mm. I think growth coming uh, is going to be really fast there. And uh, in these uh, three states, Lucknow, Chandigarh and uh, I would say in Faidabad, because Faidabad is part of NCR, but still people do not, people kind of forget about Faidabad. Faidabad is going to pick up really fast now. Be because the Gurgaon prices have shot up so much and I don't see uh, Gurgaon prices going up from now. So, Faidabad is a really important market. So, Faidabad, Lucknow, Chandigarh. One of the big bets both of you have been making as real estate developers is on townships and I think integrated townships. Uh, I have two questions on that, Pranav. Sure. Uh, since in your case, there were 18 townships to be coming up, you're building one in Lucknow and, you know, a, a lot of activities there. My question to you is, in the last five years, we've seen various versions of that, you know, and the townships, integrated townships as we talk, was a product of the 2006-2008 period when there was a lot of private equity money coming in and one thought of 7 to 8 percent growth over the next five years and compounded growth in the economy, etc. Sure. It's not quite happened and there's been a lot of issues out there. Uh, how far, I mean, do you think you will start reviving those plans? Are you going to see a pickup or do you think there's been a lot of learning within the industry? I think, uh, firstly, townships is the way forward, I think, for mm -hmm. every developer. Even if you see uh, in the budget this year, we're talking about smart cities. See, the way India is and the way population is growing and the way all urban cities are growing, whether they are tier two or tier three, without having big land banks, whether the private sector buys it or the government buys it, you cannot grow, you cannot have good urban growth and, uh, you know, international urban growth. So, big land banks and townships is the only way forward. When we got into Gurgaon in the early 80s, and we did, we've done about 2,000 acres of development there. So this concept started there at that time. Mm. And what's happened there is going to happen, and we are seeing it in all the townships we are doing in all our 19 cities. In all of them, there is demand, people are living, and gradually, okay, last two, three years, markets have been slow, so prices haven't gone up that much. But there is still demand because they are established, people are living there, properties have changed hands three, four times, so it's well established, people are aware of it. Going forward, that is the only way for the country. 
-hmm. And I think uh, if we improve our land regulation bills, which is the government is talking about improving it, and if the land costs are not so high, uh, yeah, and if they don't change it, prices will go up so astronomically in the next three, four years that real estate will become further unaffordable. Because no developer, none of us sitting here, will ever think of buying lands at today's value and then doing a development because it doesn't make sense for us. Mm. And the price will be so high for the buyer that, you know, he'll never buy it. Okay. And there are two questions in this. First, is that the way integrated townships were envisaged, is it over because nobody will have, to have the money to buy the kind of land parcels that they're looking at? And second, you know, in the last couple of years, you've seen SEZs be the flavor. Then we saw manufacturing zones be the flavor. Then we saw, you know, integrated townships being the flavor. And then you have smart cities being the flavor. Sure. What does it do to an industry? I mean, it's, it's really shifting, uh, uh, shifting trends. All of these can't be, you know, quickly overnight change into another nomenclature. Sure. I mean, they have a different, you know, uh, universe out yeah. there. So what impact is this? Look, like? to me... Uh, it's less of a problem in terms of changing uh, the, the the branding, whether it's from integrated township mm. to SEZ or to whatever else uh, you say. I think the the real issue is to seeing it through. Mm. And when you talk about integrated township, it means integrating. Integrating what? You're integrating your workplace with living, with social infrastructure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there are a couple of things that need to come together under one township in one particular zone. Has that happened? Not really. And it's not one one particular agency or persons. Exactly. Uh, it, it is a universe that you create around that, right? Infrastructure. Uh, you, and none of that. Said, I mean, a developer can't do. It's a city. So it's what a happens? City. I mean, if the infrastructure is not keeping pace with the development of uh, houses, what happens then? I mean, and isn't it a fact that the entire countryside is dotted with projects which are halfway there or envisaged to be there? And that actually has blocked up a lot of land and a lot of uh, companies uh, balance sheets so today developers are actually facing problem because of, because of this not because their plans of not because their strategy went wrong the strategy their plans they entered locations uh, it was all right it was just that probably the government or the infrastructure of this country or the growth as you said of this country did not match the way all the developers planned so as you said there there are a lot of projects which are stuck or which, which, I, which I would say they're halfway through. So for example, if you're developing, if any developer is developing say 500 acres of township, mm. thinking that the absorption of this particular city would be uh, 500 acres because of the fact that the government makes this particular highway and that highway is still not there. Mm. How can he sell and how can a, a customer would go and stay in that township even though he makes a Taj Mahal of it? Even, o even though he makes the best city in this, in this world and there is no highway to connect to the main city, what can he do? He cannot do anything about it. In this discussion, what's interesting is everybody seems to be very optimistic. So there are problems, but the growth is going to take care of it. Anurag, let me come to you on sure. this. Do you think uh, the worst is over and do you think the industry will pick up? And what could be the triggers for the growth? Because let's face it, the real demand in growth for housing came when interest rates were at 8% and there was a rapid growth in the economy. We've not got that. Instead, we've got debt-laden companies. We've got uh, stock markets that have punished them terribly. So there are uh, limited avenues of raising money. And you have a legacy problem of stuck projects in different parts of the country. How is the recovery going to happen? Yeah, so there are two, three points that you, <laughs> you make there. So look, the recovery has to come. If the economy has to grow, it yes. has to come back. Uh, if, if the country has to grow, real estate cannot be left behind. It cannot be in isolation. My real issue is uh, when it comes back, Will it come back the same way as it came back in 2000, I mean, grew in 2006 or 7? Or will it come back in a more sanitized, in a, in a more progressive, in a more cleaner way? Mm. That to me is a real issue. Mm. And that, at this point, is squarely at the doorsteps of the central government as well as the state government. So there, there is a policy side of it. And I think we covered a lot of that. Uh, sure. And you re uh, referred to the sure. industry status. But Pranav, let me be candid. One view is that the real estate sector did it to themselves. They were too aggressive. They, they charged too much for their properties. They didn't have execution skills. And as, an, as a result, there is very little faith in the industry. And they have to correct within. They have to bring down prices for demand to pick up. What would you say you know, to an think, argument like that? I think uh, it's the other way around. I think if a developer brings down prices, you kill, your, you, kill this, you kill your project and you kill your company. What happens is, if I have sold your project, say for 100 rupees, mm. and tomorrow I have to sell it to Anurag at 80 rupees, everybody, uh, he will expect that I will sell it to him at 60 rupees. So it will never happen. You know, this question is asked to us all the time. And I don't think any developer reduces prices for this reason. 
Secondly, the... But if you want to trigger demand in, at this level, which is still unaffordable to many Indians, how do you get the demand going? I don't think demand is driven by the fact that I keep reducing my prices. Because what happens in real estate is once they feel, once they get to know, in a, and they'll get to know in a minute that he's reduced prices, they'll think, okay, now he's at so much, he's further stressed, he'll reduce his price further. Mm. It never happens anywhere in the world, and it'll never happen. So I think if people and customers expect that to happen, I don't think it's going to happen. Mm. So uh, also, the, you, you also have to see the cost of land, what we bought, say, three years ago. And the prices of real estate hasn't gone up in the last three years, right? Not that much. The cost of that land has gone up 10 times. So we know it that in the next one or two years, when the markets do pick up and the economy does start growing at the six, seven desired mm. growth, we will all, you know, sell at the prices we desire. Until then, we are ready, to, we are happy to hold. Mm. And that is the reason why developers will and they never will reduce prices. Mm. So everybody's holding on, waiting for the economy to come back. And I think from a, from a stock market parlance, I mean, there is a lot of skepticism around real estate companies because a lot of uh, brokerages, for instance, don't cover many of the companies anymore. And I was going through an analysis and I'm going, I know it's going to raise eyebrows, but the OMAX stock is down 73% from the highs. The Ansel stock is down 91% from the highs. Uh, this is a tough situation. I mean, how do you see the faith coming back or the growth coming back or the sentiment really shrugging off what has happened in the past and moving ahead? Single clearance windows. Hmm. The 35 percent tax on real estate what I said from the beginning of from, from Cascading when tax. absolutely 35 percent. Hmm. So if you want to charge 35 percent that's okay but there should be one single window that I go pay 35 percent I'm done I'm sorted. Third land which, I, which is my raw material it should be made very easy for me the process of buying land and fourth is the overall economy growth as uh, people over here, they're talking about overall economy growth. I think once these four or five things are sorted, uh, real estate industry as a whole is sorted, and investors, uh, you're talking about stock market, investors, they kind of look every company quarterly, 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 on a quarter basis. They've realized now that real estate company, they cannot show the re really nice number every quarter. They are also informed about real estate uh, companies. So they're also educated. So now they've started uh, picking up the right stock, which is available at the right P, which is available at the right price, and they're going to hold it for a long term because they know that the fundamentals of real estate mm. in this country is, is, is very good. We know that there are 30 million houses shortage. We know that the infrastructure boost is going to come to this country. We know what is the vision of our Prime Minister. So everything is positive. I think the overall sentiments are also positive. It's just that we need to see how much time. Two quarters, four quarters, six quarters. Mm. If you're going to ask me, I think next two quarters, we'll be probably sitting in this uh, same room and we'll be talking really high about this economy. Okay. okay. Pranav? You know, the point you mentioned about how much reality stocks are down and how much generally the stocks are down. I think it's an opportunity because instead of uh, divesting in your company, you can do SPV level deals, like which is what we did with Brookfield and we are in advanced negotiations with one or two other companies. And people understand the potential that, and as a developer, it's easier for us to do SPV level transactions than to do you know, entity level transactions. And we have no intent of diluting it you know, anywhere close to these prices. So uh, I think also being down to that level is an opportunity that you know how much the upside is. You can't go below this the levels. Field, huh? <laughs> no, but you can't go below 90% like you're saying. You can't yeah. go to 100%. If it's 100%, that's, that's zero. You, know, you can't go below that. It's yeah, well, them, markets you know? are unforgiving, Anurag. So that, and it takes time for reputations to be built and, and, and the positive sentiment to come back. Of course, I mean, to be fair, the real estate sector has come off the lows and it's, it's doing fairly well now. But my question to you is that when will you say that this is of the past and now let's look ahead? So, again, unless you change the way you worked, I mean, unless you learn from yesterday, you know, it's not going to go away. It's going to come back. That's what I said earlier. And again, the, to, to your point, the stock market valuation. I don't know if this is the true valuation or that was a true valuation. When you say from the peak, yeah. I mean, I've known. There was a rational euphoria. So exactly. Also. So I've known of BIFR companies, their stocks suddenly going through the roof. Why? Because the analysts discovered that they're sitting on very prime real estate. They own a very large piece of land and which is worth several hundred crores, etc. And suddenly the mm. stock goes through the roof. I mean, this is absurd. By that yardstick, what Pranav just said holds okay. true. The second point I want to make quickly is the stock market is, takes a very poor view of the, the developer industry, the real estate developers. And there's a reason why. Because there are no entry barriers. There is a lot of very unscrupulous element in this industry. There is no entry barrier and that's where we need the regulator to come in. There needs to be entry barriers. There needs to be regulation on developers. 
today there it's one of the only industries that i know which can which which allows you to raise unlimited amount of money without any regulation mm -hmm. this is so, one industry that will unanimously ask for a regulator i think that's one of the things yeah, that are absolutely talked about for years <laughs> okay but if you were to look back say this is a mistake that we made we are not going to make that again what is that one mistake um you know uh, i don't from our point of view i think uh, we bought too much land which uh, i don't know if it's good or bad as of now maybe it looks like it was a bad decision but i know three months down the road i would say it's the best decision because land prices grow up by 40 50% a year interest rates is 14 15% a year so i think it's a great decision just like i mentioned earlier it's only a liquidity which is an issue for every developer mm. not solvency okay what would you say the one mistake that you made over the last couple of years which you won't repeat and you're cognizant of in, in the next leg of growth see uh, we really think that real estate is a very hands on business it's a very local business so the one mistake probably which over expanding or over over uh, exposure in terms of number of cities we just going to expand or we ourselves in those cities where we are number 1 and number 2 so me more measured look at growth and hopefully the recovery happening in the next 4 to 5 quarters gentlemen thank you so much for joining thank you thank you, thank you.